Coming up on the Nesson and Bruins podcast, we talk to Nesson analyst and former Bees goalie Andrew Raycroft and get his thoughts on the first quarter of the Bruins season. We talk to him about the Bees goaltending situation and try to figure out what might be on the horizon for Boston captain Zdeno Chara. We also give our thoughts on how the Bees looked last week and try to figure out what exactly is wrong with the Bruins when it comes to the shootout. Play the music. Hey, welcome to the Nesson Bruins podcast. I'm Nesson.com's Mike Cole, joined as always by Nesson.com's Logan Mullen. Logan, how are we? Good. How about you? Uh, I'm well. What it do, baby? Uh, how do you want to start this thing? Considering you're you're calling the shots, uh, we have <laughs> no. We have a Nesson. No, I'm never calling the shots. Mike is just a little annoyed because I wanted to regroup. Wasn't feeling it the first time we recorded this intro, but good back on track now all right you know so, yeah so, so you're the boss okay well you we're drive here, the boss we're here for the Nesson Bruins podcast as we are every week uh we have a special edition of the show this week uh once Logan gets his act together uh we will discuss the Bruins uh quarter poll uh and a whole lot of other op uh topics with former Bruins stars avalanche Canucks, Canucks. Goalie. And Leafs. And, and Leafs goalie, yeah, of course. And Leafs. Yeah. and Leafs goalie, Andrew Raycroft. Uh, Razor, also a, uh, a colleague of ours now. He began with Nesson last year doing some analyst work. I think he's doing more more frequently uh, this year. Yeah, so we hits, too. Yeah, he's all yeah over of the course. Place yeah, he now. does it all. Yeah. Uh, so we've, we talked to, to Razor about this Bruins team. Uh, we've got his opinion on just the state of goaltending within the Bruins uh, and across the league. Uh, he hit on a few other things. I thought it was a pretty interesting interview. He was he was really good, uh, really open about some of his experiences, and I think he sees the game in a much different way than we do. Obviously, yeah, so it was nice it's to get his opinion. Pretty insightful. Yeah. Uh, before we get into our interview with uh, Andrew Raycroft, let's just talk real quickly. Uh, we don't need to go into a whole lot of stuff about the last week. Bruins went was it two and one last week uh, or one two or, two zero oh and one two zero oh technically. Well, technically yeah yeah. Um, they are again this is it's more things change more they stay the same they're kind of treading water at the moment uh luckily they banked all those points early on injuries huge issue as they've been for most of the season most notably uh patrice bergeron right now so they've played 21 games that's as close as we're going to get to a quarter pole probably uh it, or you know a, a nice quarter of the way season mark uh so i guess real quick before we get into razor what have been your thoughts for the first uh fourth of the season better than i expected yeah i think that's probably consensus among everyone and if you had told me a month and a half ago the amount of injuries that would pile up for the bruins it would be yeah. even better than with, i expected beyond that with foresight and hindsight it's even it's impressive either way like it, they're more impressive than we even could have imagined and now knowing what we know about the injuries it's it makes it even well more. when you look back to even just saturday the loss to the capitals when you consider they were 59 seconds away from beating the best team in the nhl in regulation with a third line that was yeah. harlan holm trent frederick and paul carey uh it's you know, pretty impressive stick tap to them yeah uh, but it, far exceeding expectations especially considering how regularly teams who come off deep runs this season before end up starting a little slower out of the gate but even during the preseason Bruce Cassidy was very upfront about how they were trying to get in front of the curve with that or ahead of the curve rather and for now it seems like they did yeah I think they've been Pretty resourceful. If I was to use a word, maybe I would go with that. Uh, considering the, the injuries, the the expected hangover, just the the fact that they didn't have as much rest as the rest of the league, uh, all of that combined with the fact that at times the goaltending has been a little shaky, at times you haven't had secondary scoring, your blue line has been a mess, mostly because of injuries, not because of right. you know, play. You're still leaning on your 42 year old defenseman to play big minutes. Uh, you know, your new, newly signed stud defenseman hasn't necessarily put up the numbers you expected. There are a lot of things that if this team was struggling, you would point out and be like, well, it's this, this, and this, and this. But they've been able to overcome that. Whereas if, you know, the first line is the only one contributing, I mean, either A, they were scoring five goals right. a night, <laughs> or you're getting great goaltending. And it just seems like they've done a really nice job of, when one thing isn't going well, something else goes very well in order to make up for that, which is, I think, a hallmark of a really good team. Well, and it is weird because 
the th it's tough to tell sometimes if we're just being nitpicky about things. Yeah, that's true. Or if the things that are going well are just so good that it overshadows the quote unquote nitpicky yeah. things, right? Like Jake DeBrusque has not been very good. Right, Some that's of that's it, yeah. been injury related. Like you mentioned, Charlie McAvoy hasn't been great. Uh, you can go up and down the line. The stretches with the goaltending, now there have been very good stretches. There also have been some not-so-good ones. But pretty much anywhere you look, you can pick at everything. I mean, even the fourth line, which was something they really hung their hat on last year. Now, again, in part due to injuries and Nordstrom not being able to get into a rhythm, that hasn't been something they've been able to lean on quite as much. Corrali hasn't been as great. But despite all of that, it almost does make it more impressive that they are the presently third best team in the NHL right now mm -hmm. despite those shortcomings every team has them the Bruins certainly aren't but whether or not that ends up being something that bites them in the rear end down the road obviously remains to be seen which I know is kind of a lazy take but there's there's enough to pick nits about as you yeah. would like to say yeah I and I think that's probably for us also a byproduct of having a weekly podcast about right. a team that looked like world beaters through the first three, yeah. four weeks of the season. So I think we're probably coming into this trying to be a little more negative than necessary just so it doesn't look like we're completely uh, – <laughs> we're completely uh, – I can't Waving think of a, a flag. <laughs> safe for work way to, to state my point there, so I'm just going to escape by that one. But, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, you can't argue with where they're at. And if, it's one of those things, too, where they've probably already banked enough points, assuming they don't go into a complete nosedive, that they are ticketed for the playoffs as a high seed. Uh, and it, at a certain point, I don't think it's at the quarter pole, obviously, but at a certain point it's going to turn into a real strong focus on the playoffs and getting right for that. And that seems kind of crazy even before Chris, uh, before uh, American Thanksgiving, but it's it's true. I think they're that good, and I, we've seen that. Uh, assuming there isn't just complete chaos, which they've come, they've bordered on it already. Right, and even then, I mean, they they laid a few eggs yeah. already this season, but they have rebounded nicely. I think it's tough to say this. I was going to say for the most part. It seems like they are winning the games they're supposed to win. It doesn't help when you're getting dump trucked by the Detroit yeah. Red Wings. But by and large, they, they still have. Like, you can look at that at this point, uh, the loss to Detroit, and say that was probably an anomaly. And, yeah, they have positioned themselves to where they can – they should play better than 500 hockey the rest of the way, but they will cruise to a, an Atlantic division spot in the postseason – if they play slightly above average. So they have 61 games left. That's 124 points. So if you get 61 points, you're at 94. Like if you even get half of the points over the rest of the way, which would be a borderline failure, right. you're still probably getting in the playoffs. So they have Buffalo's the fourth team in the conference right now, and they have eight points on Buffalo. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah, uh, 94 would not have got them in last year. But it's – I mean, again, that is, like I said, barring an absolute meltdown. So they're good. Uh, not a whole lot there else to, to kind of pick at. I mean, that's the other thing, too, is they were so good so early that it kind of distorted expectations. Like right. playing 11-1-2 to start the season, you know, they, they weren't going to be that. So obviously there's going to be some sort of fallback at a certain point. So we're kind of just working our way through that in terms of analyzing the team. So – that's, uh, that's where that stands. Speaking of analyzing the team, I think it's time to get into our interview with Andrew Raycroft, former Bruins goalie, uh, Calder Trophy winner, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. At uh, one point in his career, I think that was the 04 season before the lockout. Poor guy. I meant to ask him about that. It's maybe, you know, tough break. <laughs> Uh, you know, playing as well as you can, and then we're going to take a year off. But uh, we did not talk to him about that. We talked to him about a whole lot of other things, mainly his uh, thoughts on this year's team, uh, some of the goaltending issues or where the goaltending stands, and, and a few other things. So that is, uh, we're going to throw it to that right now, and you and I will be back to discuss a little bit further before we get out of here. So uh, without further ado, here's uh, Nesson Bruins analyst and former Bees goalie Andrew Raycroft. Joining us now on the Nesson Bruins podcast, former Bruins goalie, uh, current Nesson Bruins analyst, Andrew Raycroft. Razor, how are we doing? Great, guys. Great. How are we doing this morning? Not bad, Good. not bad. No Thanks complaints. for joining us. Uh, talk a little Bruins hockey uh, for uh, this week's podcast. I guess we'll just start off um, real quickly. You know, the Bruins about at the quarter pole. What have been your reactions uh, to how this team has played, especially coming off of the way last year ended, you know, ups and downs, injuries. Just kind of where do you see this team at right now? 
they they're in as good a spot as they could have imagined uh, after uh, after a short summer and a, a tough early schedule. I think they've done a fantastic job from the goaltenders to the defense and then obviously the forwards with that top line and all the way they are. So they they could have been in a better spot after after their 22 games the quarter pull. Uh, they've got some injuries already that they fought through and dealt with. So. Which you know, every team does. You know, especially early in the season, guys get a little tweaks and they take their time coming back. So uh, it's been a it's been a great start to the season, and, and we all should be uh, excited for how it's gone. All right. So with the goaltending in particular, I'd say October was a pretty good month for both Tugarask and Yarrow Halak. Lately, both Halak and Rask, in my estimation, Halak in particular is seesawed a little bit. Even if he, and he's still been fine, it's a 909 save percentage the last five games. Even if he regresses a little bit, would you say that no matter what, they're probably going to stick with the splitting time evenly approach? Yes, they will. Uh, is going to get, you know, probably a dozen more games at the end of it when it's all said and done. But if they both stay healthy, you know, I, I look at that as a. You know that 45-35 split, um, what they had last year, and, and it works perfect. And you know, again, you can look at all the numbers, and sometimes his are going to be. You know, he's had a couple of the games, the, the major game where they scored three goals at the end of a seven-to-one game. You know, that 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 bumps your average up uh, as well. The other, you know, the Pittsburgh game again on four goals it was fantastic. The other night against Washington, he stole them a point. So that's his job. Uh, Tuca's going to get a little bit of an easier schedule, a little bit of a benefit of the schedule, you know, getting those games like last night where, you know, it's an easier game and Tuca makes it look really easy because he's so good and so so efficient. Uh, but in saying that, Holanda is, is really important to grab those points from Washington on the end of the second half of the back-to-back. And we've seen that and teams in the division struggle with that and, and can't get those points and their boss big dogs it just chips away and gets them further ahead than everyone else. Um, would you say, I guess this is more of a question from your experience or your opinion, but a lot of teams now it seems that they're trying to trend in the direction that the Bruins are doing where you have about as even a split as you can reasonably get between your goaltenders. Is the benefit of that as simple as your primary goalie is just more refreshed by the time the postseason comes around, or is it a little bit more deeper and nuanced than that? I believe it's a little deeper. Uh, obviously, rest is, is important. They, they do a great job managing rest nowadays. Everyone's got sleep watches and understands rest recovery. They don't practice as much or as hard. But I believe the huge benefit is that the, the starter, the quote-unquote starter who ends up playing 45 to 55 games, he gets a lot more practice reps. Instead of the guy playing 65 games, who is basically surviving, you know, practice to practice and just trying to get ready for the games and stay fresh. The goalie who gets some nights off or more nights off gets to go out in the morning skate and work with the goalie coach and work on their game and watch video and, and try to find ways to get better throughout the season rather than just surviving throughout the season. So I believe that's the biggest uh, the biggest reason to try and get your guy rest is to get them more reps of practice and be able to spend that extra 40 minutes a week with the goalie coach rather than spending that extra game out on the ice and a full day's game routine. He gets to work that 40 minutes in the morning and then have the rest of the day off and just relax and have a bag of popcorn at the game at night. <laughs> so for that reason, so Halak's going to be an unrestricted free agent after this year. For that reason, how imperative do you think it is that they either try and bring him back or find another more experienced backup in the off season this year, hundred percent. It's, it's. I think it's crucial. It's crucial to this team. I think we've seen the last two seasons that Yarrow's been here, or the you know the first hundred game sample that we've seen. How important he's been. We saw him go through stretches last year where he carried, especially early in the year, he carried the team. Uh, and, and this season, he's just come in right where he left off. And unfortunately, Tuke has been fantastic this season, but. You know, even when Tuka lost a couple games, you could throw Yarrow in and you got a win or got points. So I think it'll be essential for them to try and get Yarrow done here as soon as possible. If they don't, I'm sure they have a short list of guys 
that are veteran guys, not guys coming up from the minors, not young guys that, you know, need to find their way in the NHL or need to be mentored. I, I don't think we're at the point now where, where Tuka needs to be mentoring anyone. They need a guy who can play the 30, 40 games and, and just be a professional and work. And we've heard the coaching and the management talk about how professional both these guys are. And when you have that, it's just one less thing the coaches have to worry about. So do you see the veteran backup approach kind of playing itself out so long as Tuka's around? Yes. Okay. Yes. Short, shortest answer, yes. I think we've we've seen, you know, and, and to Tuka, I mean, he, he said it, he's, he's getting older. Yeah. You know, he's getting to that age where, you know, he does not want to play 70 games a season, and he understands his game is better suited in that 45-50 game range. So he's, he's fine with that, and that's kind of the first step as you get older to, to recognizing that and we're all you know he's such a competitor we've all we're all competing we never want to give up the net so once you get to that point of feeling comfortable in the fact that and understanding that my game is better when I play this amount of games rather than saying I want to be in the net every day and, and get as many wins and, and just be out there all the time and be the guy I think Tuca feels very comfortable in his skin and he feels very comfortable where he is in his career that he needs another guy or wants another guy around that can handle some of the mail for him and they'll be a better tandem and a better team and a better organization for that. You know, looking at Halak specifically in the success he had last year and how that's carried into this year and maybe projecting down the road if they aren't able to re-sign him, you know, they go out and get a new, uh, a different veteran, you know, backup, how important is the system just in general and specifically this Bruins system and how much do you think that's a, you know contributed to Halak's success here as opposed to you know I know he's been a, a pretty decent goalie throughout most of his career but do you think that's the biggest reason whether it's the system whether it's the time management what do you think is most important with him in, in kind of looking at that position moving forward for the Bruins specifically yeah no question just even you know maybe just separate a little bit from Halak but Every goalie is only as good as the system and mm-hmm. the players in front of them. We've seen that. You see that around the league year to year. A guy will have a great year and then he'll lose his two top defensemen and it goes away or they fire the coach, whatever it is. So the Bruins, for the last, well, basically since Zidane walked in the door, yeah. you know, have been a great defensive. And, and then Julian, I guess not the first year he was here, but, but starting year two of Zidane O'Char and first year Claude Julian, that system has been in place. Uh, and they do not give up a lot. They've been at the top half of the goals against average for the last 15 years, and that goes a lot to what Zidane is and, and was, especially, and, and along with the system they play. You have the three spurs on Krejci down the middle who are very responsible forwards, responsible defensively, and they clear up a lot of mistakes in front and don't give up a lot of odd-man opportunities. And it is certainly easier to be a goaltender in Boston than it is numerous other franchises around the league. So, no question, it's, it's helped uh, it's helped a lot come in and have, have those guys in front of them. We've seen goalies come in here, you know, I think it's like a Chad Johnson, guys who had huge success playing 20 games, 23, 25 games here, and not done as well elsewhere. And that that, that is more of an example of the system uh, being in place in Boston, and it does make it, you know, that much, it's just a little bit easier for goaltenders. So, Shifting away from the goaltending in particular, so it's setting up that with the eventual returns of Kevin Miller and John Moore, which supposedly are on the horizon at some point, it's going to create a bit of a log jam there. What do you see happening with the defense, including Connor Clifton, who has, I think, four more games left. We're recording this on Wednesday. He can play in four more games before he's subject to waivers to go down. How do you see that whole situation unfolding once the entire defense is healthy? Well, it, it's going to be quite interesting. That That's, that's an interesting storyline coming up, especially once that four game goes through. Um, you, you don't want to lose any of these guys. And However, we've seen, you know, and we see it right now this week with, with Krug out, you know, you have back and nine and up. Guys get injured on the back end, and as the season goes, you're going to need – you know, it's not just six guys that are going to roll through the whole season. So you need those seven, eight guys. Now, when you get to nine and ten guys that are NHL ready, it's a great, it's a great problem for the organization to have. And they, you know, Don's done a fantastic job building that depth um, throughout the organization. So, uh, you know, I, I'm a little, John Moore, you know, Moore and, and Miller—they've missed a lot of time 
So I don't know if we're all sure of exactly where they are at. You know, to miss almost a full season, each of them, it is a lot of hockey. And then the game changes and it goes fast. So um, it'll be really, really interesting to, to answer the question. I'm not sure what they're going to do. I, I think they've got, I'm sure they have some kind of a plan, but I'm sure that they realize and recognize that they need to find a way to have these eight, nine guys within the organization to have that depth to go on that long playoff run that they want to go on. One thing I'm curious about in regards to, you know, your playing days or as somebody who's been in a, in a dressing room like that, is there, is that something that's, you know, this, like the defense situation with the Bruins right now that you just talked about, is that something that players are, you know, wary of? Is it something they talk about? Is it something that weighs on your mind if you're in that situation? How does that type of, you know, brewing roster situation kind of play itself out among players? Yeah, no, I, I mean, as a, certainly as a defenseman, you're aware, but even, you know, just as a teammate, right. you understand and got guys know, you know, what's, where the numbers are at and who's on the roster, who's got the red jersey on, all oh, this guy's practice, you know. You come in and you see where guys are at in the lineup really quickly. You know, that's one of the first things I'm sure Connor Cliff is doing most days when he gets to the rink is what color his jersey is, who am I lining up with. So that is, is certainly a thing. It's not talked about openly, right. certainly. You know, there'll be a group of guys that go out to dinner and, you know, that they might mention it or when you're out there skating with the injured guys, you know, you'll recognize kind of what's going on. It certainly helps when it's when everyone's winning. When the team's winning, there's a lot less chatter and you just kind of go about your business and put your head down. Um, but, yeah, without a question, everyone is very aware on that back end of, you know, where everyone's ranked and where everyone's playing with and where they're at physically. You know, how, how much longer Miller has. Oh, you know, guys with the Lynn and Africa trainer or guys with, you know, that certainly happens and you recognize, you know, where everybody's at. It's, it's uh, you know, it, it is a thing. Uh, what have your thoughts been on Char this year? Uh, he just keeps doing what he does and he just keeps dominating out there. It's, it's so impressive to be at his age and, you know, it's just, because he's so smart, you know, I really notice, you know, just how good he is with angles now, and the game keeps getting faster, and he keeps getting a stick in the way, and he, he finds a way to to take angles on on these quick guys coming down on the rush. When he's in the corners, no one can get the puck off him. His stick is so strong, he's able to take lanes away on the penalty kill. I think it's it, it's been underappreciated, I believe, how good he actually is uh, every single night. And what kind of a difference he makes out on the ice as a as a goaltender? I see all the little plays that he makes, but you know that that not everyone can make, and it's certainly guys that are at 42 years of age can make. So it's, he's had a fantastic start. I think they've managed his minutes pretty well. He looks really fresh, and he hasn't had any of those you know slow moments. So I think they've done a good job. Like I said, refresh, and he's just gonna you know he's just such a big integral part of this team yeah, he's probably not going to win another Norris trophy or anything but how long do you think he can continue playing at the level he's at now or at least a, a, a useful NHL player level I mean I, the way he's playing right now and, and the way the game sets up for him physically he doesn't have to use his body a lot anymore the, you know it's moving away from that uh, he could play you know i I wouldn't be surprised if he could play three or four more years right now. And that's, again, he's, he's you know, that role will continue to diminish just a little bit, but to put him out on a penalty kill, you know, four or five night, times a night is so beneficial for any hockey team. And so, I, you know, I would suspect it's kind of up to him if he continues to enjoy working out and keeping his body in shape the way he probably has to do now that he's 42. If he continues to do that, there's no reason not to have him in the lineup and be a, a great penalty kill guy for a lot of years because he is that good right now still. Switching gears a little, what's the deal with this team in shootouts? Is there anything you see, you know, especially from maybe, I think as a goalie, maybe there's a unique perspective that you can kind of try to diagnose. Is it just one of those things where this team is so based on a offensively a, a system where it's the puck movement, it's cycling, it's, you know, they're very, very good at what they do and very good at winning games in that regard. But it seems like there's enough talent to be successful in the shootout. So I just don't know if there's something that you kind of see that is, is holding them back in that regard. Well, I, I see 
certainly the last few weeks that we talked about, I see it as confidence, and mm-hmm. it's it's a bit of a, a mental block, I believe, for the for the guys right now. Um, I think it is a skill. There's guys that are good at it, and there's guys that there aren't, and it doesn't necessarily translate to how they, you know, how many points they have throughout the regular season. I think there's a guys like a Bergeron who can be great in a, in a game, and then not so great in this shootout. That that happens around the league. What I would it'd be interested, I'm not sure how much work they're doing on it, how much work they have done on it, how much focus they're putting on it. Um, it's easier to not to let it slide a little when you're getting so many wins in regulation and it's not like you're fighting for a playoff spot for those points. Um, my one big thing is that there's such an opportunity for one of these younger guys who gets called up to be a great pet. Like, if I was in the minors right now, I would be doing shootouts nonstop if I was one of these younger forward prospects because if you can come up and win shootouts in practice and, and get your call up that way, that's how you can start making your difference. But there's there's been numerous guys over the last 15 years that have made careers being just good shootout guys. And if you can be, you know, bottom bottom six forward as a young guy, but be a great shootout guy and make a difference three or four times a year for your team just in a shootout, that can really um, boost your career and, and make you move a little bit quicker through the depth chart. Um, so that's 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 my big thing. I'm wondering, you know, that I'm curious, and I hope guys down there recognize that there is an opportunity to be a shootout guy come up and be a shootout guy and, and they all i'm sure they're all keeping track of that and understanding that but but right now with the watch that they have i just see not a lot of confidence when they pick that puck up at, at the red line to go in do you share tuka's opinion uh, about shootouts and them just being the worst uh, as, a, as a former goalie yeah, to a point. Um, but I think you have to, you know, I, I thought that initially I, I started to embrace it. I, it's better than a tie. If you think about it for yeah. the game and what I want to watch, I don't want to see a tie. I don't want to see them skate off a 0-0 zero, zero tie. Um, and everyone, you know, the shootout, you know, it's not quite the same as it was, but when it first started, it was the most exciting part of hockey. Yeah. And guy, every, the fans got into it, everyone's screaming and, so from that perspective, you have to embrace it, and it's not going away. The NHL, have, you know, they can't play 15 overtime games and keep everyone in the building till two o'clock on a Tuesday night. So they have to, you know, I think it's just embrace it and, and, and try and get better at it. And try, maybe they just have to have fun with it instead of being frustrated by it. Just go out and, you know, like you're playing with your buddies. You know, take that mentality and, and, and just kind of let loose a little. I don't, I don't know. What part of the, or how much of, of the workload is is working on the shootout from a goalie standpoint, and how much attention is paid to that in terms of preparation and just kind of in the everyday, you, you know, everyday going about your business? Yeah, so you'll, you know, most of the time you'll get some kind of a shootout going in practice, yeah. you know, once or twice a week, uh, just for fun, and even if it's only four or five guys, you know, one of the end of the end of practice games, and so you'll, you'll kind of work on it there. The real preparation, though, is, is just watching video of the other team before every game. So we, we even when I, when I was playing, we had video looping of the other team's shootouts, you know, four or five previous shootouts. So we'd watch, and you'd try and find a pattern, try and find a trend. All right, this guy scored, you know, Zetterberg scored the last three times making this move. You know, if he, if he takes the clock and goes to his left, he's probably doing this. If he goes to the right, he's probably doing that. So certainly take take uh, patterns and, and things from video uh, and what guys have done successfully and what they've missed on to try and have an idea or a sense and, and probably just give you a little bit of confidence going into that shootout. I mean, there, was, you know, there was a few times when I knew what the guy was doing as soon as he picked the puck up, you know, and I got to my spot before he could get there. So, um, you know, I think that's, that's where the real preparation for that game-to-game shootout comes from is that video beforehand. Otherwise, you're just kind of messing around with shootouts and trying to make it during game or sorry during practices. Uh, somewhat related, I guess. What, how important, I guess, or how prevalent is the dynamic among you know the goalies, the goalie coach, and the head coach? I, I ask this because it seems like Cassidy, in his press conferences, is a guy who is unafraid to criticize players if he needs to. I know he's called out Rask at times. Uh, you know, for when it's needed, I don't think it's ever, you know, over the line or anything like that. I just think it's interesting as a guy who didn't play goalie, you know, kind of, I wonder, 
if, if goalies get kind of offended by that or if they're a little sensitive to that and how, and also in the same regard, Cassidy is always quick to credit uh, goalie Bob and, and the work that he does. So I just, I'm interested how, how that kind of works out among all the parties involved. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, in this case, with, with you know, every every case, is, you know, some guys are sensitive, some aren't. Yeah. I would assume that Cassidy and Tuca and, you know, Yarl and Bob all have, it, it seems as though they have a very good relationship in the point where uh, whatever Bruce is saying on TV, he's saying in the dress group. Mm-hmm. So as long as those messages don't get crossed or, you have one, you know, him saying one thing and then hearing another thing somewhere else. That's when those can be, you know, a little bit of a problem, and goalies will get extra sensitive about. But I would imagine, you know, the back and forth sounds pretty, pretty similar within the dressing room that that we don't get to hear. Uh, goalie coaches and their, you know, role and responsibility is to be that filter between the goalie and the coach at times. You know. Sometimes a coach will think a goal is terrible, and that's the goalie coach is going to hear about that. And the goalie coach is either going to say, "Yeah, that was a bad goal," or he's going to say, "Well, this is why it happened, and this is why this isn't a terrible goal." Because there are a lot of goals that happen that people will think a goalie should have had it, or that was terrible. What was he doing there? But there was a play, you know, the play developed two or three seconds earlier that you know, forced him into that situation. And you can recognize, oh, okay, this is why he got in that position. And that's not necessarily as bad as what we initially thought. Or there's a tip here, or he didn't see the pass across. There's lots of different things that the goalie coach will remind the coach, the head coach, like, hey, this is why that happened, and, and these are the situations that he was in, and why that goal happened. So, and then conversely, the goalie can complain, you know, not complain, but, 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 voice his opinion, voice with the goalie coach, and the goalie coach can bring some of that to the coach, whether, you know, that certain systems they're playing, or the way the penalty kill set up, or those kinds of things. So, it, it's, it's a very important role to kind of mediate between everybody. Alright, last one for us, and it has very little to do with the Bruins. Uh, how are you enjoying Perfect. life as an analyst now? Uh, I love it. I, I really love it. Uh, it wasn't something that I... I came out of hockey thinking that I wanted to do, but fortunately to get a, get a, a few games here the last couple of years at Nesson and now to be doing more, I, I really enjoy it. Um, I think it's, it's been a great way for me to get back into the game and uh, a great way to go in and watch games again and, and just feel like I'm a part of something again and uh, to be on with the guys, Billy and Dale and Barry, it's, it's just been a lot of fun to hang out and then to go down to the ring you guy, you know, see other trainers from other teams, and I, you know, the interview so important. It's just been a lot of fun, and I look forward to to doing more and, and getting better at it, and, and hopefully, you know, progressing, and you know, maybe someday making this a career. All right, good stuff. Appreciate it, Razor. Thanks for hopping on. Yeah, you got it, guys. Thanks a lot. Take Thanks care. We'll talk soon. Okay, so that was Nesson Bruins analyst and former B's goalie Andrew Raycroft joining us via the phone. Uh, big thanks to Razor for joining us. Hopefully we'll have him on again this season. Uh, continue to see his work on Nesson and follow him on Twitter at Andrew Raycroft. Pretty simple there. So uh, shoot him a follow. I was actually poking around his Twitter. Some pretty good insight there yeah. uh, in terms of uh, stuff maybe you don't get on uh, TV as well. So so go follow Razor on Twitter as well. Uh, you wanted to pick through a few things that, that, uh, from our discussion with him, most notably the goalie situation uh, yeah. and as it pertains to Locke? Yeah, well, understandably, he's probably a good guy to ask about goaltending. And you do see the direction that the NHL is going in with the most successful teams often being ones where they can play uh, their goalies evenly. Yeah. Uh, look at the Islanders, look at Edmonton. Uh, you know, with mixed success, the Blackhawks are trying to do that right now. Everyone's starting to model that. And, you know, it, it's interesting to hear him really emphasize just how imperative it is for the Bruins to have either Halak or someone of that ilk back uh, during the coming seasons, uh, especially while Tuka Rask is around. And, you know, yeah. that's something that Rask hasn't shied away from. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Raycroft mentioned how comfortable in his own skin Rask is. I don't feel like every goalie would necessarily be that way. Like they would look at that as a threat that the other team had to, or that their team had to go and bring somebody else in. 
but that's how you create sustainable results, right? That was the best postseason we've seen out of Tuca in yep. years this past season. Um, so to see Razor here, rather, Razor really put the emphasis on investing in that. Yeah. I'm curious to see how much of that sentiment is echoed within the Bruins. Yeah, a couple of things. I think it's, in hindsight or whatever, not surprising that Tuca is so in on that. If Tuca retired today, he would do so as, statistically speaking at least, the most successful goalie in Bruins history. He's got a Vesna. Uh, I think he's got an all-star game appearance. The only thing he doesn't have is a Stanley Cup. I think that hangs over him. I think that's the thing that hangs over him in terms of perception uh, within the market uh, and across New England. So I think he's probably in a position in his career where he, you know, he's, what is he, 32? He's, he's going to be 33 yeah. in, in the spring. Uh, he's a guy who, you know, he's got that one thing left that he's chasing. So I think he's probably a little bit more receptive to that, which kind of brings me to my second point about that conversation. That part of the conversation is it'd be interesting to talk to the Bruins about it candidly or, you know, even, you know, I, I was going to mention it with Razor, but I, it's just, it's a hard thing to, I, you know, we only, you don't want to sit there and spend a, an hour on the minutiae of the goaltending situation as it pertains to the cap. But I'm interested to see how they would handle that from a financial standpoint, considering right. they're already up against it and they're going to have to start paying guys as they come up, as we saw this past uh, summer. So that's something where it's, you know, easier said than done to go out and get that, uh, right. that veteran. Although the thing is, Rask's contract, I believe, is almost up. So I think after next season, yeah. Right? So I don't, you know, I don't think he's going to get the same deal as a 33 year old as he got as a 27 year old or whatever it was. So right. maybe that's where the money kind of comes from is a, a little bit of a pay re, uh, pay reduction for him. All that being said, yeah, I, you know, I think it was interesting to hear from Razor about the the day to day aspect of it that you don't necessarily yeah. think of where it's. You know, you can, you know, you get off your feet a little bit more often, whether it's practice or games. Right. And, you know, it, I think that goes a long way. And they, they clearly hit it out of the park with Halak as it pertains to Rask in their relationship. Like, I think those guys yeah, get along real well. And that probably, probably makes it a little bit easier to, to, to share, the, share the net. Yeah, and w another thought on the way goaltending tandems are trending it's going to become increasingly the blessing and the curse about that working is that if you already have an established Tuka Rask, Yarrow, Halak situation, then you're fine. It's at a manageable cap figure. He's, yeah, Halak's cap hits 2.75. That's not a problem at all for the Bruins, but guys like Halak probably will start getting paid right. more. Yeah. And that's going to become more of a premium because everyone's going to try and replicate that. Yep. Uh, so he, I, I don't know how much, but it seems like if he continues at a pace where he's a 915, 920 save percentage guy playing in 35 to 40 games, then he's going to get a good deal, whether it's in yeah. Boston or elsewhere. Interesting guy to talk to in this whole thing would be Halak himself and kind of right. figure out where he's at in terms of his career, how comfortable he is in Boston, how willing he'd be to stay. Mm -hmm. Maybe not at a significant discount, but I wonder how important that the Boston – uh, aspect of this whole thing is to him so right. that'd be something worth uh, discussing with him at a later date hopefully we can do it uh, right here on the Nesson Bruins podcast uh, I think it was also kind of interesting um, what he said about Chara and I think you know I'm not going to disagree with anything Razor said I think, but you know he's a guy who played with Chara so I don't right. think he was going to sit here and say that he's he's bad but I thought it was very interesting and it, I hadn't really thought about it in a certain amount of ways but you know, I, I think Razor's point was that well, among his points was you don't need him to necessarily be the player he was, and right. he still provides value given what he does. Uh, and nobody would know that better than a former NHL goalie. He sees things that we don't see, and he those little things in addition to the leadership are where I think Char really brings the most amount of most value to a team like the Bruins. Yeah, and I my take with Chara lately has been. His, the fact that he's always in tremendous shape and the fact that he's so tall is going to keep him yeah. in the NHL for a while because whatever shortcomings he has now in terms of skating ability or just pure defensive ability, he makes up for by having a massive yeah. reach and always being able to stay in lanes and whatnot. And to hear Razor kind of emphasize that, I don't know, was 
nice for me to hear because that's kind of been the hill that I've died on with Chara. And yeah, I mean, he's not going to win another Norris trophy, but he is useful for what he's asked to do. Yep. And especially on like the penalty kill, like where you said, where if you think about it, it makes sense. Like you're not asked to do a whole lot more and he's just taking up space. So it's, you know, right. when that's, you're, yeah, what you're asked to do. Yeah, right. You're literally, there's more space to defend. And he's a guy who has a 35 foot wingspan, it feels like. So, well, more. and I, you know, he takes these uh, not pay cuts because this is what it's been the last couple yeah. of years but he's costing you two two million dollars like if he does play for another three four years kind of like uh, yeah. Raycroft floated then you could do a lot worse for um even if he drops to his the third pairing yep. by the time he his career is right. winding down like it, again that that's what they're paying Kevin Miller it's what they're paying yep. John Moore like you sometimes you have to get your third pairing guys for two million they're not just going to be rookies and mm -hmm. guys on entry level deals so yeah, you know, that's uh, I found that interesting, especially how much longer he thinks he yeah, can Yeah, right. Char would also be instrumental in, you would hope, like shepherding or heralding the, the upcoming crop of young defensemen who we've yet to see really break through. So that would be interesting to, to yeah. kind of see him coach them along as a, as, as a player. So, uh, yeah, so that was interesting. Uh, I thought that, you know, some of the, the nitty-gritty playing stuff was – uh, interesting. I think you know, there's not a whole lot to pick through from our standpoint. He said it better than we could. Yeah. But in terms of the shootout thing, I thought that was uh, – I, I think he's dead on about the – I mean, it is – you look at the Bruins, there is some talent there mm -hmm. in terms of being – you should be able to <laughs> score in the shootout. But the confidence has to be just – almost next to nothing Shot. at this point. Yeah. yeah. And I do wonder – I found it interesting about how he – made sure to mention that guys in the minors right now if they're yeah, good right. at shootouts yeah. they can carve out a role for themselves at the nhl level and you know the the bruins haven't gotten into the so many draft those shootout well, right like they don't have that uh, sorry i didn't mean to cut, no, cut yeah. off your point i thought we were making the same point like they who is that guy in the ahl anyway? right well that's what i'm thinking is and somebody who follows the ahl closer than we do probably would be able to tell us but that's not I, I imagine that's probably not a skill that you draft for, especially when right. Like and if you, you have David, I mean, if you have David Pasternak, you probably assume that some of his skills with his hands will translate to a shootout. Yeah. But I mean, and I think to Razor's point, they're trying to I'm talking about bottom six guys who try and <clears throat> excuse me, carve out a role for themselves on the shootout. I think that's what they're trying to do with Wagner because Wagner's yeah. always had pretty good hands and the two times that they've tried him out there hasn't gone so well, but there must be something that they see in practice that lends Cassidy to keep sending him out there. Yeah, I, I don't know if this has been done, but I think a deep dive would be interesting in how teams across the league really approach the shootout because, and Razor kind of hinted at this, uh, not to put words in his mouth, but this is something I just kind of connected the dots. Like, I wonder how much they actually do care about it. Right. You know what I mean? And they shouldn't, if you really think about it, like, I know this is difficult to say in the midst of them losing every shootout they've been in for what seems like the last five years at this point. But, like, they those points probably aren't going to matter to them. I know you're playing with fire right. when you say that. But I think at this point in their – where they are and with this team, with this core, you're like, let's just get in the playoffs. We don't have to deal with the yeah, shootout they in the playoffs. can gamble with it a little right. bit. I did just pull up, though, the uh, shootout stats for the P Bruins from last year. And uh, – Believe it or not, 50%, two for four, Trent Frederick, and two for two, Anton Bleed, uh, okay. who's currently injured. So I don't, you know, they the goal know, is, isn't Frederick as good. was up for the game the other night where the, the Washington shootout and he didn't go. Well, should, so. like, use it, like, that's the time. You might as well, you might, if you got you a guy. You just got yeah. a point against the best team in the NHL and you're rolling with nobody in your lineup. Well, you might as well use him, too, because right. to one of Razor's, Razor's point, too, like, they, I don't. I wonder how much Trent Frederick tape is being played in the Washington, you know, dressing room. Uh, on you know, I don't think they have a whole lot of him looping on the shootout yeah. uh, film. So he's, maybe there's a element of surprise there. So yeah, who knows? Know. Anything else? No, that was good. I thought it was interesting. Yeah, I've said interesting like twenty. Yeah, me too. Times yeah, it a, this has but, quickly become a crutch yeah, word for was, both of us. It was, it was good to hear his perspective because obviously he sees things yeah. a couple losers like us don't see, just sitting on our couch watching right. and taking. Yeah, notes. and having having been there too, I think is an interesting perspective. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> uh, but he kind of touched on. I I wanted to ask him about that with the coaching uh, dynamic. 
which he kind of took us behind the scenes there and, and figure you say how that kind of works out and it's always kind of neat to get the <laughs> curtain peek uh get a peek behind the curtain there so uh yeah big thanks to to andrew raycroft for joining us again follow him at andrew raycroft on twitter uh be sure to tune in to nesson's pre and post game to check him out uh there on the, your tv uh, you also do some hits from time to time on Nesson's other platforms. Nesson Sports Today. Well, he's on, yeah, but yeah. He, then Nesson Sports Today also comes on, was it Nesson Sports Update in the morning? That's right. Uh, Nesson Digital Channels, maybe on the YouTube He's all page. over the he place. Is. We're all everywhere. He's, uh, it was good to get in on the ground floor because there's big things coming for, for Razor, and hopefully we can have him on again at some point this season to talk Bruins. But uh, that's all you and I have for today. Logan, it's always a pleasure. Interesting stuff. It was very interesting. <laughs> uh, we will be back again next week to discuss probably another two or three Bruins shootout losses. Uh, in <laughs> to, that. to the wild. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. There's some winnable games <laughs> here. Soft that's schedule. Yeah. Uh, the Bruins feeling good, though, right now. A very decisive 5-1 win Tuesday night. I think they're, they're back on track. Yeah, future Boston Bruin Blake Coleman scoring for uh, the Devils. I don't think you were here when I cornered that take. Blake Coleman's going to be the uh, solution on the middle six right wings for the Bruins. That's our cue to lead. Right? Speaking of interesting. Yeah. Uh, all right. Full podcast for that. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks, Logan. See you again next week.